Ooh, it is a gorgeous day out here today, especially after being cooped up all winter long and just having snow and cold. Actually, it really wasn't that bad this winter. It was pretty mild, but today it's like 60 degrees out here. This is gorgeous. So we're gonna go for a walk. I wanna go over here, see the pond, but I don't know how I'm getting over there. Probably gonna have to go through the woods because I don't wanna go through this stuff. Look at that right there. We're not crawling through that stuff. Got new shoes too. Look at. Yeah, can we make it through? Oh, it's, oh hello. Yeah. Wow. Oh, more mud. Yep, coming out. Oh, yeah. There we go. This is where we want to be. Right out here. Look at that sun. All right, so I didn't just come out here just for the walk and to see the sun. I really wanted to talk about here. I've been meaning to make this video for a really long time, but it is the top five most common questions that I get asked about our weather balloon program. You know, flying weather balloons is not exactly a super popular hobby. So when I run into people, whether it's at a personal event or a work event or something I'm actually doing with weather balloons, People like to ask a lot of questions, so let's get some of those answered today. Okay, question number one is probably an easy place to start, which is, how did I get, even get into this? So originally, back in 2015, my wife bought me an Arduino computer. It's kind of like a credit card sized computer, circuit board really. And for somebody like me that's a software engineer, love the idea of making something, especially connecting the software world into the hardware world. And so I started building my, my first project and I built really something simple. It was just an LED that would turn on and off automatically. It would turn on, a few seconds later it would turn off. I called my wife over and I said, honey, come here, you gotta see this. I built the most amazing thing ever. It's so awesome. And I showed it to her and it blinked and it went on and off and on and off and that's all it did she wasn't very impressed so i figured i had to make something real world something that would actually be something that could be done out in the real environment i mean blinking an led in my office was kind of like all right cool but if i could actually make something that would interact with the environment that would be pretty awesome and so the first thing that i found was these high altitude balloon flights. Super popular over in the United Kingdom. They do a ton of them there. And everybody was using Arduinos and Raspberry Pis to do this sort of thing. I thought, well, I could do that. I love space. I like science. I like programming and software engineering. And so I went to work. It took me months to get into it. And then in April, 2016, we launched our first flight. It was Overlook Horizon 1. And we set it off into the air and I never saw it again. It's still out there somewhere. Failed, battery failed. And I figured we gotta try this again. Overlook Horizon 2 went up and we found it. Saw the pictures from that one and I was hooked. Absolutely loved it from there on out. And that's how I got started in weather balloons. Question number two that I get asked all the time is, is it safe? How do you make sure that you don't collide with aircraft and that you, you're actually being a good human being and not being a hazard to everybody? And the answer to that is yes, it is absolutely safe, but there are regulations and rules that you have to follow. Those are super important to follow because they ensure your own safety, they make sure the aircraft are safe, and that you're making people's job easier especially for air traffic controllers and pilots and people that manage our airspace. Now, more than just following the regulations, we actually go above and beyond and we do some of the things that are required of big payloads, but not technically required for us. And that's things like having an open dialogue with the FAA, having a good relationship with them. They've actually watched some of our videos and some of them are fans. So just taking that extra step to understand the rules, make sure you're following everything that's out there and being in open communication with your local FAA office, 
makes things so much safer and easier for everybody involved, and especially air traffic controllers. Their job is hard enough as it is, so if you can relieve some of the stress by providing them all the information, it just eases everybody's mind. Okay, question number three is a pretty easy one actually, which is where do we get helium from? If you don't know it, helium is actually kind of at a shortage right now. It's a non-renewable resource and prices are just going through the roof, our prices included. And so finding helium can actually be tough, especially if you're an amateur, you're just getting involved with it. There's a lot of places that don't wanna provide helium. We started out by getting helium at a local welding supply store. The other option is you can go directly to one of these gas suppliers that would be like Prax Air or Air Gas. Those are the big names around and you can try to rent directly with them. Typically, they're gonna want a corporate environment. So that would be things like schools or businesses. They want a corporate account. They're not gonna rent directly to individuals, but you can always try. And the last thing that I've seen people do is actually go to like Walmart and buy party balloon helium tanks. This is not a great option, but if it's your only option, okay, fine. But just keep in mind that those helium tanks from like party stores and Walmart and things like that are typically not the purity levels that helium would be for the National Weather Service or if you're going to Prax Air or Air Gas or a welding supply store. So you're not gonna get the lift that you would from a regular helium supplier. Okay, question number four. How do you find it again after you launch it? So generally a weather balloon flight is going to have some sort of tracking system on board. Ours typically have two, sometimes even three tracking systems on board, but there's three common tracking systems that you can fly with. One is a cell phone. I don't recommend doing that. It's technically not legal in the United States to have tracking on board a cell phone and have it actively tracking while it's in flight. It also doesn't work once it gets above like 5,000 feet. So it's not a good solution. Option number two is a GPS tracking system. This would be things that like hikers use when they go out hiking up a mountain and they wanna have some sort of GPS tracking system. The most popular one is probably the Spot 3 Messenger that is used on weather balloons all the time. It's a great tracking system, but the tricky thing here for this is that it needs to be pointed upwards at the sky at all times. Where that becomes problematic is when you land. Sometimes the payload box will tip on its side and you need to make sure that your GPS unit is still pointing upwards when it lands on its side or upside down. So the best way to handle this is to build some sort of gimbal system like Emily Calandrelli, the Space Gale did when she launched her weather balloon. I mean, this is an amazing gimbal system right here and it's super easy to build. The last solution is really the best solution, which is amateur radio tracking systems. In order to do that, you have to have an amateur radio license. That's ham radio. This scares a lot of people. It is super easy to get a ham radio license, especially the technician level here in the United States. It's really not that hard to do. There's practice tests and apps that you can get for your phone, for your iPhone, your iPad. It's really not hard and I recommend it highly. It's good for 10 years once you do it. Then you can get into all sorts of things like radio controlled items and even go beyond weather balloons. All right, question number five is a big one. It probably should be question number one, to be honest, because it really is the number one question that I get asked. And I could really make an entire video all about this, and I'm sure we're gonna get some hate comments as well. But the question is, why do you use a fisheye lens? Oh, all right, let's see if we can explain this and try not to make too many people angry? That might be impossible. So here's the thing. The big reason why we use a fisheye lens is because the camera is easy to work with. It really has nothing to do with the lens itself. It's just that the camera works well with our tracking systems. We can power it up and power it off very easily with our circuit boards. It lasts with an external battery for the entire flight. It produces good quality footage and the wide angle lens or fisheye lens doesn't bother me. Someday will we try a different lens? Sure, 
Why not? It's just not our top priority right now. Right now, we're testing things like the reliability of our tracking system. We're trying to do live video from our balloon while it's in flight. We're trying to do cutdown systems so that we can recover our balloon consistently without a crazy amount of effort trying to get it down from an 80 foot tall tree. Those things are much more important to me than helping flat earthers determine whether the earth is round or flat. It's just really not my goal, but you're welcome to go for it. At some point, we may do a more in-depth video about fisheye lenses or about the curvature of the earth, but that's not really what this video was today. Really, I just wanted to get you the top five questions and the answers that we have for them. All right, so that's it. Top five questions that we get asked all the time. Some answers, maybe you like them, maybe you don't, I don't know. But if you like this kind of format at least, let me know, hit the like button, maybe consider subscribing or leave a comment below if I missed anything or you have other questions that you want me to answer in part two of this. Well, my son has gone down and now it's starting to get cold again, so I'm gonna head back inside. But I'll see you guys on the next video. See ya. You know how long it took me to set up this shot and try to find a spot in the grass that wasn't covered in geese poop? This was a bad decision. Really, you're gonna fly directly overhead and squawk at me? Try to make a video here. How am I supposed to make a video with this going on? Thank you.